All right, it's more to the picture than meets the eye. Behind the lens with legendary sports photographer Steve Babino. I'm John Horrigan. Well, Babs, nearly 50 years of hundreds of thousands of photographs, the Boston Bruins, Boston Celtics, the Red Sox, concerts from the Boston Garden and TD Garden, college hockey with UMass Lowell, Boston University, the NHL, the WHA, Major League Baseball, Boston Celtics, and more. Babs, how are you? Good, bud. How are you? Great, thanks. Hey, on this show, we're going to talk about covers, cups, and cards, okay? Covers of magazines that you've done, Stanley Cups that you've covered, and then some hockey cards. And I know that we spoke about this briefly in the last episode, but this is one uh, cover of the hockey news, and this is very important in your career. Yeah, this was my break that uh, first year after I'd asked the hockey news if I could shoot the NHL because I had shot the WHA for them for two, two years prior to this. And uh, they got me in. Uh, they, they got me as credential and uh, went wherever they told me. And this happened to be my first cover. I think it's dated October 14th, or October 18th, 1974. Yep. Andre Savard, Jimmy Roberts. And I think I proved my track record with them the two years that I shot the WHA that, you know, I could shoot. I could travel to Springfield, to Hart, you know, Hartford, Boston Arena, the Garden, to shoot the WHA. And, and it was magic that I was able to get into the Garden, you know, officially, uh, basically kind of like Bobby's, you know, Bobby's last year, last couple of years playing the game, Bobby Orr. Wow. And then this one here, the hockey news, Iggy, when Jerome McGinley played for the Boston Bruins. What a great player he was. Yeah, this is one of the magazine. It was originally a newspaper, and they started to go with the magazine cover, the magazine style. And I just, you know, I pulled this out because up until, uh, up until this last cover that just came out this year of Pasternak, this was my last hockey news cover uh, for the magazine. But I did have, you know, plenty plenty in that window of time going from the newspaper to the magazine. But this happened to be my last one up until this year when they put pasta on the cover that wow. I took at uh, training camp. Wow. And again, one of the great players of all time, former Calgary Flame. I, I've been told he still lives in the Boston area that his daughter or somebody may be going. Yeah, to he's, uh, you know, I remember doing his uh, the dog calendar shoot and went to, uh, I think it was a condo downtown Boston somewhere. I'm not really sure if he, because that's where he is now, but. Great guy, great guy, super to talk to. Great was, player, Hall of Fame. In the days of just shooting Calgary and him, and then when he comes to Boston, I told him who I was and how long I'd been around. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Wow, wow, Iggy. And then this one on the yeah, left this, first. So got that other one with Gretzky was like a, a magazine that they had done on the top 100. And obviously, that's my my photo on the cover. But then this this last one up to date as of right now was this photo that I took at training camp which they turned into Haja Pasta or whatever it is. But uh, so as of right now, the Pasternak one is, is the last cover that I've had with the hockey news. Wow. It's been a long He's journey. If you go back, figuring that I was shooting, you know, for them 72, 73 up to, up to now, you know, uh, I'm still involved. A small amount, you know, small amount with the hockey news. They, they know that Brian and I are up here and we're doing all this posed set up stuff at training camp and, you know, that's what they like to see sometimes. Sure. And Pasta, what a great forward he's been uh, for the Bruins. He's been a media star getting all sorts of commercials, Dunkin' yeah. Donuts. He's, he's doing a lot. He's, he's, you know, he's a great player. He's definitely a sharpshooter. And, uh, you know, he definitely has some talent. And you get him the puck, and he's going to put it in the net. <laughs> yeah, and he was on his way 50, maybe even 60 goals before the quarantine. He was just yeah. on fire. That one-timer from the left-wing circle. And, of course, Gretzky, did he make the top 100 players of all time? Do you know, Babs? Uh, I, I, think, I think he's like uh, – he, he's, he's definitely in there. <laughs> okay, great. All right, let's – okay, let's go top to bottom, left to right on the cards here. A lot to talk about. Let's talk about – oh, I hate that picture, Babs. No offense. Yeah, I, do, I do too, but it, it, unfortunately – it's, uh, it's a top card of Bob Ewell when he went to Chicago, and obviously they wanted to come out with something. And it's my actual photo of Bobby in a Boston Bruins uniform. And Topps, before Photoshop, had somebody paint that uniform on his torso. But it's my photo wearing a Boston Bruins uniform. <laughs> That's funny. And, of course, Bobby, um, he was screwed by his agent, Alan Eagleson, and, and he spent three years with the Blackhawks. He only played a handful of games because of his knee injury. And had we had 
uh, better knee surgeons the way we have them today. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, oh. it's really sad. He he, it's unbelievable. Probably the records that he would have set, you know, and probably still hold today, if he was able to play a longer career. You yep. know, it, it, he revolution. And you know, I I say as a fan, you know, seeing him play originally in '66 with the Bruins going to games with my next door neighbor, it was like, it just seemed like the other guys were skating in sand. And Bobby was, Bobby was on the ocean skating. Yeah. And, and it was just unbelievable that he could, you know, carry the puck the way he did over the blue line deep. You know, I don't remember seeing defensemen prior to that. They go to the blue line and dump it in. Go to the blue line, pass it off. But they never carried the puck over the blue line into the face-off circle, into the goal. And Bobby just took it that other dimension, curled behind the net. People started chasing him. As soon as two guys chase him, that means that one guy's open. And, you know, and so, you know, and you look at the player, the defenseman that kind of followed him later on, you got Denny Potvin, you know, you got uh, Larry Robinson, you know, you got uh, Phil Housley, you know, uh, those, those guys played the same style. They carried the puck. They set, it, they set it up. So, I mean, he changed. Defensemen all of a sudden were getting lots of assists when Bobby came into the game because that's, that's what you saw. The, the puck was going back to the point. He was carrying it, just passing it off, getting it back, passing it off, you know, and setting up, you know, the, the Esposito-Hodge-Cashman line, you know what I mean? Setting up Chief in, the, you know, that Stanley Cup team. So he was, he was above and beyond everybody else at that time. You know, definitely with his ability, passing, shooting, skating for sure. And first defenseman, I believe, to get 100 points to lead the league in scoring. And as Bobby points out humorously, he came in in 66, 67. As you mentioned, his rookie season won the Calder Trophy as the league's rookie of the year. But uh, he said the, the Bruins got worse once he joined them. They dropped from fifth to sixth. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was always a battle for the fifth and sixth place between us and the Rangers. And, you know, if we finished in fifth, it was like we won the championship, it seemed. But, uh, you know, that's the way it was, those – those other top four teams, you know, with Hull and Howe and Belavo and Mahav, uh, you know, early Mahavich and Davey Keon with Toronto. Bobby it, Vaughan, you know, yep. They had great teams, you know what I mean? It just seemed like we were getting the bottom of the picks of the – but all of a sudden Bobby comes to us and we make a couple of moves, get Nespo, the Hodge line, Hodge and Espo, and, and Turk comes to town. And all of a sudden, that grit started to grow a little bit. Johnny McKenzie, and it was it was fun to listen to. I remember listening to it on the radio back in the day at the house, my mom and dad's place, and and then every once in a while, getting those obstructed, you know, going with my next door neighbor. He had pretty good seats, but then I ended up going myself and you know buying those obstructed view seats. So. Sure, and moving down. All right, to the right is the great one. I love this one. We spoke about this in an earlier episode. He's watching the clock. Tell me about this one. Griffey's rookie card. Ooh. Uh, in the NHL or WHA? This is his NHL rookie card. Got it. It is a photo of Wayne playing in the WHA that last season. It's a game in Springfield, Massachusetts, and it was a game against Gordie Howe. And I got a phone call. I really can't remember if it was Hockey Digest that called me or Tops that called me. It might have been both of them, actually. That, you know, here's this kid, Gretzky, who was with Indianapolis Racers when the season started, played maybe a dozen games or something like that. And then the franchise folded. And then he got picked up by Edmonton, that he was coming around my area, which, you know, being in Boston, Springfield, Massachusetts, because the, uh, the roof of the Hartford Civic Center had collapsed and the Whalers were relocated to Springfield. So, you know, I listened to the, the request and then I realized that, okay, I'd shot Gordy playing for Houston. I remember going to games and see Gordy playing for Detroit. Uh, never had the opportunity to photograph him with Detroit, but it was a game against the Whalers and now Gordy was playing for the Whalers. So I just looked at it. My first, my first thought was, hey, it's Gordy Howe. I'm, I'll go photograph Gordy Howe, not really realizing who Wayne, you know, I knew who Wayne Gretzky was, but, you know, the kid was only 19 years old at the time. You know what I mean? And, and 17. So, 17. And how, so how good can he really be? You know what I mean? Playing against a, these, these grown men. And, and so, you know, I went down there really, you know, to get some photos of Wayne, but really take some photos of uh, Gordie Howe. And 
And I remember when warm-up started, you know, I was right there in the penalty box with no glass and shooting. And then all of a sudden he came by the boards right where I was. And, and I just kind of like, hey, Wayne, can I get a couple of shots I'm shooting for? And I, you know, I think I might, might have said tops. And he just stood there and he looked right at me. And I got a nice shot of him just staring right, right at the camera. And we're going to look at that photo in a future episode. We're going to do more yeah, in the great I one. But I saw him during the game and, and uh, you know, but this is the photo. You know, I don't know how many I sent in to Tops, but all I know is the next year, the WHA Foles, Edmonton, Winnipeg, the Whalers, and Quebec yes. come into the league. And uh, he's on the hit list. He's on the hit list that, come, that they wanted to get out on the first pressing of cards, which would have been in that start of the season, October timeframe. And I'm looking at a logo that I'd seen or the, or the, the Jersey that I'd seen for the NHL Edmonton Oilers and the Jersey that I seen had seen with the WHA. And it literally was almost identical except for the crest, the size of the Edmonton Oilers crest circle was bigger on the WHA uniform than it was on the NHL, but the color sequence of the uniform was the same. So, you know, they had had these pictures that I had taken uh, there and, you know, they picked this one. You know, I mean, I have lots of other pictures from that WHA game and uh, a couple were used down the road by some other people. But this is the one they picked. And I think it's, you know, him, him in the uh, slot area skating back up the ice. And obviously, to me, he's looking at the clock, just checking the timeout. Maybe it might have been a penalty or it was close to the end of the period. Oh, cool. And, of course, uh, World Hockey Association, you talked about Mr. Hockey. The great stat that I like in hockey is a goal and assist in the fight. Gordie Howe, Gordie Howe hat trick. Here's an American all-star playing for the Arrows, the Houston yeah. Arrows. Yeah, I mean, again, this is when uh, Topps decided to get away from the Pose WHA photos. And, you know, I had been shooting for the Hockey News, the WHA, and, you know, I was shooting some cover shots, co some color shots, and I started to submit – you know, some color action shots at the WHA and they drifted away from the post photos and started to use a lot, you know, a lot of my pictures from various games that I'd been shooting, shooting color. You know, in those days I was balancing between shooting so many rolls of film of black and white, so many rolls of film of color. Obviously color was more expensive to shoot. So you really had to have some type of a game plan of where you were going to try to move these pictures. And, but I think by me sending you know, tops these color photos, it gave them the option now, do we want to use another post photo of Gordie Howe from training camp, you know, versus putting in a game action photo. And uh, they started to drift that way over the last two sets of cards that I believe they did, 70, 77, 78, and then the 79 last year. Uh, so, you know, my first hockey cards technically were WHA cards. And then in 76, I had my first, uh, 1976, I had my first NHL cards. Wow. So you were born of the WHA. And, of course, the uh, Houston Arrows are one of the inaugural teams in WHA. I believe they were supposed to be the Dayton Arrows or the Dayton Arrows. Yeah. And he played with his two sons, Mark and Marty. And uh, it was quite a draw, and they were quite a good team. The oh, yeah. Arrows. They had, uh, you know, they had a definitely uh, Wayne Rutledge in goal. And, uh, Ron Graham. And Gordy, Andre Lacroix played for them. Uh, you know, Gord Labasia. Yeah, yeah there, was, there, was some, there was some good, you know, you want to say second liners, third liners, but, you know, they had a good core, I guess is what I'll say, of experience uh, hockey players. You know, it wasn't a bunch of young uh, college kids or stuff like that. They had, they had some skilled players on that team for sure. And we're going to do some more on Gordy and um, the Golden Jet in another show on WHA. So to the right is, I can tell you a quick story. Bruce Crowder, former Boston Bruin, last season in the NHL is uh, with Pittsburgh. And they say, can you put up the kid, you know, the 18-year-old kid? Can, can you uh, billet him? Sure. So he and his wife, Lucy, put them up. Very charming, charming young man. Um, plays against the Bruins. And what's he do his first game against the Bruins, Babs? This is a picture from his first game. This is actually warm up from his first game. And on his first shift, he scored a goal. <laughs> yep. And obviously you had the hype similar to Gretzky that Mario's coming into the league and our opening game that season was against the Pittsburgh Penguins. So, you know, was, I'm on the bench and as soon as he stepped on the ice, you know, I just started shooting him. I never in a million years would have thought that they would have used 
a warm-up photo of him as his first card, but I think maybe they wanted to show him up close. And, uh, you know, I had shot action of that game with him in it. And, but this is the picture that made it. And this became his rookie card for, for tops. Now, if you look at him, like Ted Williams went away and missed uh, prime years uh, in two wars, the Korean War, World War II. Jordan stepped away to play baseball. Then he retired again and came back and played two great years with Washington. People don't understand that. Then this guy had two retirements due to illnesses and injuries and uh, fighting cancer. And he came back. What a marvelous career. Yeah, no, he's a, he's a, he's a legend. He's a legend, you know, he... He big guy, really big. Looked like he was skating a little bit slow, but all of a sudden he could make the move and, and carry the puck and control the puck. And uh, you know, he wasn't. You know, I wouldn't say he was physical, but you know, he could take it. Uh, and every once in a while, he could dish it out. But the, the key is, he just had so much the skills. He had the skills, puck control, passing, shooting, and uh, you know. Had a couple of good wing, wingers playing with him over the years. And uh, same thing, coffee fed him the puck, just like or fed Esposito the puck, you know, back in the day. <laughs> and, and so, you know. One great. thing, though, Babs, I'd like to whisper, Mario did not back check. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, yeah, you, you're right in saying that, I guess, in a roundabout way. But, but when he would take a stride, he could go slow, but when he took a stride, it was a stride that carried him a great distance. <laughs> okay, and he made up. You know, I guess that's the way I'll describe it. You know, so, and, the, and the Penguins were such a joke. I mean, they were good in the 70s. In the late 70s, they had some really good scores. Then they became a real big joke. And Andy Brickley could tell you stories about that. And then Mario shows up, game changer, legit yeah. franchise. People want to play there. Fans come to the building. And he truly uh, revolutionized the sport of hockey in the city of Pittsburgh. Yeah, unbelievable. Okay. Now I remember, being the, I remember being in the elevator at the garden one night and uh, I happened to get in and I brought this picture and uh, I think it was a 16 by 20 or a little by 14, but it actually was a picture of Mario from his first game. And wow. I'm in the elevator waiting to go up to level three and all of a sudden who walks in? Mario Lemieux. And wow. I, I gave it to him in the, uh, in the elevator as we were going up and uh, you know, he was like very, very appreciative of it. And, you know, he remembers me, you know, sitting where I always would sit in between the boards at the garden. And, uh, you know, I said, hey, it's magic. You know, first game in the NHL. You know, you got to have, you got to have something. So, yeah. You know. hey, just let me ask you this. I'll tell you a story. I was working on a video with the Boston Bruins in 1985-86 season. Edmonton Oilers coming to town and I'm hauling cable. I'm like a gaffer for this cameraman. And the guy shoot shoot a, I think it was Messi, I shot a shot off the glass and I jumped and then he starts pointing, they start laughing, they start rapping shots off the glass as soon as I turn my head. Yeah. Have you ever had anybody do that to you or annoy you intentionally while you were uh, photographing the game? Well, I mean, I don't know if it was jokingly. I mean, uh, I remember, I remember, well, first of all, I broke six ribs sitting in between the benches at the garden. I broke two fingers sitting in the penalty box at the old garden. Uh, Explain. I remember when the, uh, they put out this rule that anybody ice level had to wear a helmet. You know, that was back, you know, I'm going to say in the, in the 90s, a couple of, couple of guys get picked off. And so I'm in between the benches and, uh, and I'm wearing a hockey helmet, you know. And I remember a couple of the guys on the team when there was like a commercial break or whatever, and I was just standing there. All of a sudden, I get this tap on top of my helmet by one of the Bruin players going off the ice, tapping me in the head. And uh, I really hated it because I could not get the camera with the CCM helmet with uh, the ridge right here. I couldn't get it close enough to me that I, you know, just you think about it. You're holding a camera for how many years, and you're holding it right up to your face, and your eyeball is right here. But now, all of a sudden, the camera is like an inch and a half away or half an inch away. Oh. And it was just freaking me out. So I remember, I remember going out and I bought a Red Sox batting helmet. I bought a Red Sox batting helmet. It had no flaps. And I literally just turned it around. I turned it around where the rim was much closer to my head. And I started to use that. I started to use that. And I got away with it. But I remember getting a couple more taps with that. And then I finally decided, okay, I'm just going to go with a black hat. Because now, now 
<laughs> I think the people know that I'm wearing a helmet, but I'm going to go with the black hat, you know, and turn it around like it's the batting helmet. And next thing you know, I was okay. I mean, I, you know, wow. I think, knock on wood. I mean, I only, in the, in the new building, I only remember getting, I got a ricochet one night around the glass when it came in and it ricocheted around and it hit me in the shoulder. But then I remember a face-off. There was a face-off where OT was taking the face-off in front of the Bruins bench. And I had holes cut in the glass, okay, on the side. You know, here's, here's, here's the visiting team's bench. Here's the Bruins bench. And I had holes cut in the glass so that I could take a close-up shot through the hole of the player or a couple players that were at the very, very end of the, of, end of the bench. And I had a little bit of a – I have a relationship with Brett Hull, and here was Brett sitting right there, right there. And I got the camera like this, and I'm up against the glass getting, taking the picture, and the face-off puck is being dropped. And it was one of those puck drops where it got dropped, and it literally, on the way down, I don't even think it touched the ice. OT had won it, and it immediately came right up, right up, and hit me right in the back of the head, and banged my head into the glass. Oh. And Brett Hull freaked out. <laughs> He just started laughing, <laughs> smiling at me. And, you know, because we knew each other at the time. And this thing just came, boom, hit me right in the back of the head. Luckily, it hit me flat. The puck had hit me flat. It didn't, didn't cut me or anything like that. But, yeah, that's kind of, you know, I've had, I've had some lumps. I've had some lumps. And, yeah, the uh, ribs. You said the ribs. And at no uh, kitchen, uh, though. Uh, Montreal Canadiens, I had George McPhee. This is in the old garden, and I had George McPhee in the penalty box in the old garden. And that penalty box, like, had no depth to it. So I'm sitting like this, and my back is right up against the glass, and literally the boards are right here. So McPhee is sitting to my right, and I'm shooting over McPhee's shoulder. And Svoboda picks up the puck from Montreal, and he comes this – he he's going this way – far side and he's coming around the net he's got his head down in the corner and cam comes down my side of the boards and is hugging the boards and as Swoboda picks the puck up behind the net cam lines him up and he sees him at the last second and then he shoots the puck up the boards and he literally line drive and it's coming right to the visiting team's penalty box and rather than McPhee put his gloves up and knock it down he backs up, and when he backs up, he exposes my chest. Oh. And the puck comes in and hits me right in the ribs. And I'm going like this. I flinch, and then McPhee looks up to me. He goes, I guess I maybe should have knocked that down. And I go, yeah, that would have been a good idea. <laughs> he was a tough player. And, he could fight. You know, the penalty's over. He gets out, and, you know, you can't get out of the penalty box. I'm in the visiting team's penalty box. And there was, there was no commercial timeouts, like really back in those days and stuff like that. So all I remember is maybe about four minutes later, I'm starting to breathe. And as I'm breathing, I'm just feeling this, uh-oh, uh-oh. And what do they do? You can't really do anything for broken ribs other than get taped up. So I didn't go back there, finish the game. And I remember taping myself up. And, uh, and I, I, I think this might have been like a Thursday night game. So, you know, am I wimping out? The next game, I think, was Sunday or Saturday. Am I wimping out? No. I go in with my ribs taped up, <laughs> okay, and I go back to the penalty box, and I'm sitting in there, and all of a sudden, I remember it was LB, Lyndon Byers, and somebody. The puck just dribbled to the penalty box where I was, and all of a sudden, I see LB and this other player, like, lock horns, shoulder to shoulder, sticks crossed, and ride – right to the penalty box and the two sticks went bing bing hit the glass didn't hit my head my head goes back like this but i put my hand down on the boards to brace myself my my right hand and when they locked their arms and got to the boards they brought their arms down real quick and i got the butt ends of their sticks across the top of my back hand and it broke my little finger and I was literally there in the penalty box. I remember the, the, uh, the penalty box attendant, you know, sitting there and, and I'm standing there and, I, and, and this finger's like up in the air and I'm holding my camera, holding my camera. And I remember we just got some tape and we kind of taped it, but it was definitely, it was broken. So, wow. you know, try not to be a wimp and get back in there and then get, get hurt again the next night. But 
you know, it was an unbelievable place to photograph the game. Unbelievable. You're in the game. You're hearing the chit-chat chit back and forth. You're feeling it. You're feeling the breeze as the players are floating, by, flying by you. Wow. You've got to be on your toes. You've got to be – there's no doubt it's dangerous. You've got to be on your toes, and you've got to be in the game. And, and, you know, knock on wood, you know, I have terrible luck at basketball games, but, <laughs> you know. Yeah, might, might as well tell that story, Babs. Well, Celtics. you know, I mean, uh, we got the gig. Uh, you know, I shot the Celtics early on, late 70s in the old garden for NBA, and then come into the new building, and the Celtics, you know, we, they had a photographer. And, uh, but then the opportunity came up and, you know, I was asked and, and, you know, Ryan was now in college and it, it kind of made sense. So we took the gig, but the bottom line is we're sitting so close. I mean, you're, you're sitting so close on that, that under the basket, uh, literally, you know, anything can happen. And, uh, and for me, unfortunately, you know, I get KO'd. Charlotte Bobcats, I believe it was, Okafor, the original Okafor. Uh, this guy took this three-point, you know, three, you know, it would have been a three-pointer if it went in, but he shot from way back, and the ball literally landed real short, and it bounced. It just bounced once, it bounced twice, and it was going to hit the fan right here that was to my right. And I put my hand up like this to catch it, to at least knock it down. And as soon as it hit my hand, I felt this bang. And what it was, was Okafor at the last second decided to lunge for the ball. And as he lunged, he clipped the videographer that was to my left, to my right, left, whatever, you know, right here to my side, lost his balance, and he elbowed me right in the head. And you can see in the video of the hit where he hits me, hat goes sideways, and I just tumble to my right. And... Then the next thing you know, I see the videographer standing up in the video, the videographer is standing up and the photographer that was to my right, who was a little bit of further away from me, he's getting, and they're waving over to the Zamboni corner that we got a problem. And the ball was immediately thrown right back in because it was late in the game. And I think it was like 20, maybe 15, 20 seconds later, the ball starts to come back down the court to our end. And you can see the two security guard twins McCorkle's standing on the court and my feet are laying out on the court. And, but it basically was, I was knocked out. The blow knocked me out. I was unconscious and the Celtics team doctor had come over. And I remember being asked what my first name was. What's your first name? What's your first name? What's your first name? Babs? And, uh, you know, I finally said, Steve, and they helped me up and they walked me off. And, but he, I remember him being, very strict in saying to the EMTs that he was out, he was out, he needs to go to the hospital. So what ended up happening was uh, I couldn't turn my neck. I couldn't turn my neck to the left. They x-rayed my neck, you know, they took the brace off. They, you know, after about four hours and said, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have a headache and you know, you got a, you got a sprained neck. Uh, but you know, that, that was it. And I, I took that as, the diagnosis. And so what ended up happening, I didn't shoot any more basketball that year, but that was the year we went to the Stanley cup finals against the Chicago Blackhawks. So I kept shooting hockey. I kept shooting hockey because I felt that was now more protected. I was behind the glass in the corner and uh, you know, and I shot hockey. And then during the, those 20 games, I started to have some problems with my back. So when the season ended, uh, you know, they gave me some injections in my back and uh, I went to Florida to kind of rehab. And when I came back in September and started shooting exhibition games, I found my, that was the year they added the second layer of ring lights around the balcony uh, at the garden, advertising the Hegan Sun Bud Light, you know, these color lights with, along with the big jumbotron. I started going home with massive headaches blurred vision, watering eyes. And it's like, I couldn't figure out what the heck was going on because I felt really good coming back with my back. Here I was down in Florida, walking around Disney all the time, whatever. And it finally got to the point where the, one of the, the, the doctor, Dr. Asnes with the Bruins had seen me outside the dressing room in between periods and my face was just filled with water, tears. Oh. My tears were just, I wasn't crying, but my tear ducts were just leaking. And all I remember is uh, I went to uh, one of the team doctors the next day and, 
and he put me through some tests, which kind of really scared me a little bit. And I was diagnosed with severe brain trauma, mm. undetected for those three months that I was in Florida. So my body had adapted to Florida. And now I was back in the building, carrying stuff, bending and stooping, tracking. I had no problem tracking the players through the lens. But when I took the camera down and was looking at the big picture, the building was moving. The fans, you know, the colors, the jumbotron, everything was kind of like just like rocking back and forth. So, you know, I told the doc that moment where I was for the deciding game of the Stanley Cup final against Chicago when I didn't know I had this problem, okay? And I was uh, 198 feet in the catwalk on the boom stand shooting, <laughs> shooting the game uh, from an elevated position and uh, when Chicago beat us. And uh, when I told him that, he just looked at me and he shook his head and said, okay, you know, uh, you know, I was sitting down, so, you know, I didn't – but I didn't know I had the problem. I didn't really didn't know I had the problem. So, but anyway, you know, I took, I was in vestibular therapy and speech therapy. I was amazed at, you know, what it was, you know, and what I had to go through. And, and then finally uh, got back, turned a lot of the stuff over to Brian, you know, as far as he did all the basketball, but then I was cleared to start back therapy. And I took that as a good sign. And there was a game coming up that Brian wanted to go down to Florida for a weekend and, and, you know, we talked and, and I said, okay, I'll do the game. And I, I went in and shot my first basketball game against the, uh, the bulls and I got run over again. Oh. I got hit by Dunleavy and Dunleavy put the ball in the basket. And then he it was one of those ring around. It was around the ring like four times before it falls. So he's like looking back at it, looking back, but as he's looking back, he's walking, you know, and he literally walks off the court right into the videographer flips over him and he lands in my crotch <laughs> with a glancing blow to the head. And, uh, that ended up over a period of time, a year getting injections and rehab and trying to strengthen your lower core, your back. And that ended up being, uh, back surgery, two wow. discs, two discs taken out of my back. So, you know, you know, when you look at when you look at the situation, uh, I had concussion as a hockey player in high school. Then I've had technically three concussions as a photographer and uh, six broken ribs, two broken fingers, uh, back surgery. If you take the snipping of the disc back in the 80s and the 90s because of work and carrying, I had that done twice. And then I finally had this back surgery. So, you know, uh, but, you know it's part of the game. It's part of, uh, you know, I mean, I've seen other guys get run over at football games. I, you know, I had some other friends that basketball games get hit and, and it's dangerous. It, there's no doubt about it that being in that position, uh, I classify it as the Daytona 500, you know what I mean? And I'm not, I'm not worried about the basketball player coming down the court on this side. That's right in front of me. I'm worried about that guy coming on the far side who's coming towards the basket. And then if he's pressured as he's going in for the layup, he really only has about, I'm going to say, three steps max before he would be in where the photo photogs would be sitting. So I know the NBA has made changes. They've tried to adjust to it, and they've got these escape lanes now where it's two, two spots and then a, a path and then a spot and then a path. So they've eliminated space on the, on the basketball floor, which obviously helps. But, you know, if a player is really moving at a high velocity of speed, he's got, like, instant – to uh, make that decision, you know, is he going to just go into the crowd, hit, hit this guy, or is he, you know, can he can he react to turn? So uh, it's interesting to see these games that are being played right now down in uh, Orlando, and you, you know, because the photographer's not not allowed in around the court and see all the space that's around the basket. It you is, know? yeah. And, and uh, the rail you know, cam. <laughs> it's, uh, but it's it's part of it, and uh, I'm sure that every. Every team photographer that's out there, well, I don't care what it is, you know, you've probably had an incident once or twice. You know, at Fenway Park, we were always worried about those foul balls coming into the photo pits, the third base and, and uh, first base photo pits, because they'd be coming in at 100 miles an hour <laughs> if they sure. came in. And, you know, they would just ricoch ricochet around. So, uh, you know, I'm sure every pro photographer has had 
some lump along the way. Sure. So have you. So, Babs, we've come to the conclusion of this episode. I want to thank you. More to the picture than meets the eye. Behind the Lens with Steve Babineau. I'm John Horrigan. Join us for our next episode. We're going to go part two of Cups, Cards, and Covers.